Okay, so today I'm talking about nanotubes and electronics of small scale structures. Um, and I should say that I've, I've tried to gear this talk toward undergraduates. So if you're an undergraduate in the, la in, the, in the audience, please ask me questions as we go along if it doesn't make sense. And if you're a faculty, then you especially have to ask me questions because if it doesn't make sense that I've really done something wrong. <laughs> or if you want to know more about it, I, have, I can say a lot more than I'm showing here about anything. So. Um, I'm going to start by just giving a general background on mesoscopics research. I'm a condensed matter experimentalist, and I focus on small-scale structures. So I'll define what those are, talk about why it's interesting, and then talk about my specific research on carbon nanotubes, um, how you know what the history of those are, why they're interesting, how we make those devices, um, and then go on even more specifically into some data that we've taken on um, on these materials, um, looking specific specifically at um, low-dimensional behavior, one-dimensional behavior, and even we call zero-dimensional behavior of these objects. Oh, dear. Okay, so that's, oh, haha, -ha, look at that. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, okay, so uh, I just want to start by showing uh, the people who actually do the work on this. Uh, some of it I, I did as a postdoc, but a lot of it is done by my current uh, research group at University of Illinois, and a lot especially by my postdoc, and some students in a collaboration with other groups at Michigan State and at Harvard, and of course it's funded. We couldn't do any of it without funding from the NSF and the DOE. Okay, so the, the basic, for, for all of the work that I do, we really ask one big question. You know, um, what happens electronically when we shrink things down, right? If you take a piece of metal, you know, a spoon, you know, a, uh, a faucet, <laughs> and make it really, really small, you know, down to the nanoscale even, you know, billions of a meter, how do electronic properties change, right? What's different about a very, very small object compared to a very, very large object in terms of physical principles, right? How does a physics different when things are small versus when they're big? And you can think of this if you just first consider, you know, a piece of gold that's, you know, a few millimeters and you can hold in your hand, and that obeys Ohm's laws, right? You guys have seen this, V equals IR. You sort of know what goes on there, okay? Then, on the other hand, you take a single atom, and if you've had quantum mechanics, you sort of know what goes on there, too. It, it obeys quantum mechanics. So, you know, particle wave duality, uh, you know, it can go through barriers without, without stopping. You know, an elephant can't do that, but an atom can. You know, it has, has phase coherence. It fills, the electrons fill atomic shells. So you sort of know what goes on on either side of this, big things and very, very small things. And the question I, I approach is, I ask, is what happens in between? What happens when you have something that's, a few atoms long. You know, here's, here's a nanotube that's about 10 atoms in diameter. Okay? That's small enough that you can still see quantum properties, but big enough that you can actually measure it. Right? You can't measure a single atom with probes, but something like this you can actually measure with probes. So this is the area called mesoscopics. It's something between macro and, micro and microscopic. It's small enough to see quantum properties, but big enough that you can still define a bulk property. You can still study it in the way that you do you know, bigger things and, and think about what, what, what the physics there is. So, you know, what, what really interests me is how do you get from here to here, right? How do you build up your physical understanding? How do you go from quantum mechanics to, to big things? And what interesting science is there to, to learn along the way? So this mesoscopics research is, is what we call a bottom-up approach, you know, starting from small things and making them bigger, a bottom-up approach to, to understanding physics and to making devices. You know, at the end of the day, as electronics get smaller, it's more and more interesting to look at smaller devices, what happens in small structures. And I've written here just three big questions that, that I'll, you'll see keep coming up throughout this talk. What are the questions we ask when we make things small? Well, one is, you know, how, does, how do low-dimensional systems, here I say one-dimensional or zero-dimensional systems, differ from two or three dimensions? Right? It turns out that, um, you know, here's a picture of Alice in Wonderland, as she found out, things are different when you're smaller, right? You guys are, okay, anyway. So, <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, in small systems in physics, um, you see stronger interactions among the particles. Electrons interact much more strongly. You can see interesting phenomena due to that. Uh, you get unusual correlated states to these strong interactions. You see quantum mechanical behavior. You do see different things when things are very small and confined to small spaces. Um, we also want to see, can we see and study quantum properties, right? Well, how does quantum mechanics manifest itself it's, if it's not one atom, but not, you know, a big thing? If it's a few atoms across, how do you see quantum mechanics in these things? And also, can we make devices out of these? What, you know, can we make something novel in these really small structures and, and you know, make something useful and interesting? So these are the basic questions that we ask in this research. Now, as I mentioned, there's, there's a practical motivation, and that's, um, to make really small circuits. Now, you guys have probably seen Moore's Law before. Uh, it, Moore's Law says that the number of transistors on a chip, the transistor density, 
on any given chip um, is increasing exponentially um, every year, right? So if the density is increasing exponentially, it means the size is decreasing, right? Um, and, and this has seemed to work out amazingly uh, since, uh, you know, since, since the 1970s. And, and the computer manufacturers are really desperate to stay on this curve, right? Um, but as things get smaller, we're already at the size where the, the size of a transistor is, you know, the, the order of 65 billionths of a meter, or, you know, across. That's really, really small. That's nanoscale already, right? I mean, you could think that's, that's, you know, a couple hundred atoms across right now. So already, just practical considerations in electronics of the things that we use every day forces us to try to understand and work with nanoscale objects. And again, you can see that, you know, as you pattern things down, uh, you can get to about 65 nanometers. You can use advanced technology to get a little bit smaller. But if you start moving to things like nanotubes, you can get even smaller if you work with these sort of structures. Um, this sort of nanoscale mesoscopic research is also key to using quantum mechanics to make um, to make more advanced devices than you can make class with classical mechanics. And one example of that is a quantum computer. Now, a quantum computer is something that uses quantum mechanics to to uh, to uh, to get many more bits than you can get with with classical mechanics. The idea here is that uh, you use things like um, spin, which is a quantum property of things, of uh, of 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 electrons, uh, and uh, these. These quantum mechanical states, say spin states, not only can be an up or a down, right? That's one bit, up or down, but they can be in a superposition of both up and down at the same time. So you don't only get two states out of that. You get, you know, up, down, plus up, down, plus down, up. You get four states out of just two bits, in that case, for a quantum computer versus a classical computer. So that's just one example. So in general, for, for classical computers, you need uh, two to the n calculations um, uh, from n bits, you can do uh, two to the n calculations, and for a quantum computer, you only need n calculations. Okay, so you can get many, much more powerful parallel processing out of a quantum computer than out of a classical computer. But in order to do this, you have to use quantum mechanics in small structures. You need to manipulate spins. You need to define qubits. You need coherence in small structures. You need to use, harness the quantum mechanical power of small structures to implement these sort of um, quantum devices. And finally, you guys have heard of, mes of nanotechnology. Mesoscopics is smack in the middle of nanotechnology. It's researching on, on small-scale structures. In general, nanotechnology is just, is just making and studying things on the nanometer length scale. That's basically what I'm talking about here. Um, there's a lot of interest in this in all different areas of, of chemistry and physics and material science, from you know, making, putting colloids into paint to, to uh, you know, working on carbon nanotubes like I do. And there's also just been a lot of funding for this area. You can see that the investments in nanotechnology have been in the orders of 1.5 billion for the past few years. So there's funding and a lot of interest in working in this area. So this is the motivation for doing this sort of, this sort of research. Now, um, I'm in physics. There's a lot of examples of, of nanotech research or mesoscopics research in physics. Here's just three to give you a sense of the work that I'm talking about. Uh, people can work on, you know, I said mesoscopics is taking going from one atom to, you know, 10 atoms. And people do that explicitly by using um, a, a special probe to put individual atoms in a line and see how they can build up from one atom to lots of atoms and see when it starts getting, you know, properties of a wire versus of a single atom. They do this using a scanning tunneling microscope. People also can fabricate nanostructures. Here's an example of a nanostructure that's used as an optical trap that only lets through certain wavelengths of light, right? used for understanding how you can trap certain wavelengths, also for all optical switches. Uh, again, the scale of these, of these holes here is sort of 100 nanometer holes. And, uh, or you can study things like molecules, DNA, molecular transistors, nanotubes. These are just different examples of this sort of research. <clears throat> 